We're talking about uh, integration, product improvement, tying, one of the thorniest parts of this case, one of the least resolved issues of this case in some ways, given that the DC Circuit sent it back and the Justice Department decided not to retry it. So there are lots of unanswered questions left that I hope we'll have a chance to really get into and introduce the moderator of the panel and let him take over from there. Uh, professor Andrew Chen, an associate professor at the University of North Carolina, teaching intellectual property and antitrust. Uh, in addition to uh, his law degree, he also has a doctorate in computer science. And during the trial of this case, he was the law clerk to Judge Kennedy in uh, the district court in DC, and spent a lot of time helping Judge Jackson's chambers on some of the technical issues. He's written about the case, written about this particular issue, and is a really good person to help uh, try to guide our panel as they try to guide us through some of the issues. So uh, with that, Andrew. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be on this, uh, this all-star panel um, uh, with, uh, w with very impressive uh, uh, colleagues who, who uh, uh, I only got to observe in, in silence from the jury box during the trial uh, as uh, a law clerk seconded onto the case. Um, and uh, I, I described this, this uh, uh, courtroom sketch is the foul ball I caught at the, the uh, World Series. Um, I, I'm delighted to be joined in, in the order they'll be speaking. Uh, Steve Holtzman, who's a, a partner at uh, uh, Boyce, Schiller, and uh, Flexner, and uh, was uh, on the sen a senior member of the uh, trial team uh, uh, for the Justice Department. Uh, Dave Heiner, uh, who's Vice President and Deputy General Counsel of Microsoft. And uh, Ed Felton, uh, uh, professor of computer science and public affairs at uh, Princeton University, who was uh, uh, an instrumental part of the government's case on, on tying, and uh, in, in fact was uh, examined by uh, both uh, uh, Dave and Steve. Um, and uh, I, I guess another reason, uh, you know, the the talk of the town is the the Section Two uh, report from the Justice Department this week, and and another reason why. Uh, the, this uh, uh, still not fully adjudicated tying claim is, uh, continues to be a currency, I, I think, uh, uh, from the Microsoft case, is that um, if the Justice Department's uh, recommendations that the nominal per se rule against tying uh, be finally uh, abolished in favor of a rule of reason, and if uh, they, going further, uh, the uh, the disproportionateness standard uh, uh, is is used uh, to weigh a, a, a claimed pro-competitive benefit uh, against anti-competitive harm. Um, those developments uh, will have been uh, inspired in, in large part, I, I think, by the uh, the, the uh, approach the DC Circuit took uh, in in Microsoft Three. Um, so uh, the, the, these are just uh, a, a couple of exchanges from the, the colloquies uh, uh, involving our panelists. Um, uh, so uh, the, one of the odd aspects of uh, Judge Jackson's um, uh, management of the case was that direct uh, testimony was submitted in, in writing, and, uh, and so we didn't get direct examination in, in, in terms of uh, uh, courtroom testimony from, from uh, Professor Felton until uh, the summer during the, re the rebuttal part of the case. And, and, and uh, so uh, uh, Steve uh, was able to bring out uh, the Justice Department's theory of, of uh, uh, Professor Felton's uh, uh, contribution to the case, technical contribution to the case, which was a, a suite of programs which uh, he uh, argued was a uh, proof in concept that demonstrated that Microsoft could uh, deliver a version of Windows 98 from which the uh, Internet Explorer web browser product had been removed and, uh, and can, could be done so without uh, disturbing the non-web browsing functionality of Windows 98. Um, Microsoft uh, uh, sought to pin uh, Ed down on uh, what code uh, represented the Internet browser product in Windows 98. 
and in particular argued that uh, four files of uh, called uh, uh, dynam dynamic linked libraries, uh, which are used to provide uh, platform code to a number of functionalities in, in, in Windows 98, include, including uh, web browsing and, and the rendering er engine within the browser and, and other fundamental aspects of the web browser. Um, all of those are supported by uh, common DLLs, but they're also used to support other functionalities uh, and, and uh, new services uh, in, in the operating system, some of which are relied on by, by third-party applications developers. And so uh, uh, Dave uh, cross-examined uh, uh, Ed during the case in chief, and uh, uh, our, uh, they had this exchange over whether these four files constituted part of the the uh, pro uh, the product, and uh, uh, Ed stuck to this, the uh, definition that he uh, gave of, of the, the web browser in Windows 98, and it's an implicit uh, definition. It, it tells more what the product does, the, the browser product does, rather than what it is. In uh, so uh, his uh, definition is that which allows the user to browse the web. Uh, which may seem circular, uh, but uh, uh, as, as I'll, ha uh, I'll have comments later on that uh, dig a little more deeply into that, in that definition. Um, so uh, Microsoft's uh, position in its proposed findings of fact was that the software product consists of code and nothing else. And uh, why this uh, sort of gives the uh, gives the foundation for the, what the D.C. Circuit did and uh, w what uh, may provide the inspiration for a move uh, to a rule of reason is that uh, the, the D.C. Circuit took from the idea that a software product consists of code uh, the notion that uh, the OS and the browser product in Windows 98 are integrated, not in the sense that's uh, given in the 1994 consent decree, uh, but uh, in, in the sense that two uh, products have been made one physically uh, by virtue of being delivered in the same uh, set of code that's put on the CD-ROMs. And uh, that this uh, provides the pro-competitive benefit that uh, is not properly accounted for in the per se analysis of, of tying claims and in fact would be enough to provide a justification under the rule of reason. And um, I, I, I note that uh, Dave has uh, 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 supported the D.C. Circuit's analysis in, in, in a recent symposium article in uh, the University of Chicago Law Review. So with that, I'll, I'll um, uh, leave it to, to, to Steve to discuss the, um, uh, the, the Justice Department's uh, 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 theory of the, um, the, the time claim and, and uh, uh, put that in, in uh, a perspective, uh, in, in, the, in the perspective of developments in tying law. Thanks, Andrew. Mm -hmm. um, I actually uh, was going to march through um, what the Justice Department, um, how we approach uh, the time claims, but um, when the Justice Department, today Justice Department, um, issued its report on single firm conduct earlier this week, it, sort of changed my plan because it was an opportunity to, too good to, to pass up um, to really talk about the contrasts between, between then and now and, and as a way of framing uh, things going forward. So uh, as you, most of you probably know, uh, this past Monday, the department did issue uh, n a new very long statement on monopolization, uh, single firm conduct under the Sherman Act. Um, one thing that's interesting at the outset about the new report is that it covers tying at all. Um, and it's interesting for the maybe superficial reason um, that tying is ordinarily thought of not under Section 2 of the Sherman Act, but under Section 1, not a single firm conduct, conduct but as, as multi-firm conduct. It's also interesting because um, in the Microsoft case, um, tying was really an issue under both Section 2 um, and Section 1. And in the D.C. Circuit opinion in 2001 that Andrew, I think, alluded to, um, it's interesting because the D.C. Circuit really came out different ways um, on the same conduct between Section 2 and as part of the Section 2 analysis and in looking at the Section 1 analysis. 
So it seems clear uh, from, from all these things that um, tying, um, particularly when it's looked at under Section 1, um, in regard to which the D.C. Circuit uh, held that you shouldn't apply per se rules in the circumstances of this case, but in sh should instead apply the rule of reason, it seems to, to put people, start tying them into knots, um, contortions to figure out how we ought to deal with these thorny issues of, of coercion and integration and the benefits and harms that, that flow from them. And one thing I think it's worth asking, actually, sort of as a jurisprudential question is, is you know, why it is under Section 1 um, that the tying claims in this case and, and in others do seem to tie people and, and, and courts, commentators, uh, in, in, in knots. I think one answer may be because um, so much of the development of the law actually had been stifled by the uh, existence of a per se rule. Um, when you have bright line rules like that, the deal in absolutes, it makes it difficult for, for courts and litigants to figure out really what are the, what are the issues um, that should drive, should drive the analysis. Under Section 2, uh, when the D.C. Circuit looked at um, the, the fundamental tying claims, the conduct that underlied the tying claims, it was able to sort of march through. It had this balancing test set up. And it was able to march through really very expeditiously uh, the pros and the cons and say, this is anti-competitive. It's part of a, a Section 2 violation. But when Section 1 came up, had the per se rule, the court immediately focused on, really had to focus on, the sole issue of whether a per se rule ought to apply. And this, frankly, prevented the D.C. Circuit from getting to the substantive issues, sent it all back, said there shouldn't be a per se rule. And of course, that was the end of it. And as a result, the law still hasn't developed under Section 1. So that's where we are now. DOJ is still struggling with them. Uh, the FTC and others are still struggling with the tying issues. Uh, and in fact, it's now DOJ has even apparently exported uh, this, this, these contortions to Section 2 uh, because it's discussed this in the context of single firm monopolization. So very briefly, what uh, in the report this week um, has the DOJ said about tying? First of all, it has very strongly reiterated the view uh, that uh, no per se rule should apply uh, to tying at all. I mean, moving well beyond the issue, cases of, of, of technological uh, integration. So that's number one. Number two, uh, the DOJ has seemingly compartmentalized uh, the way of thinking about tying. It talks about contractual tying talks about bundled ties. It talks about technological tying. So that's number two. Number three, as a general matter, regardless of which type of tie it's talking about, the department says that plaintiffs have to uh, prove harm that is substantially disproportionate, not just outweighs, but substantially disproportionate to pro-competitive benefits. And then with regard to technological tying, um, it focuses on, uh, it defines technological tying as, uh, quote, a tie achieved through integration of what could be viewed as two products. So that's the definition. And then once it has a tie which it chooses to characterize as a technological tie, um, its commentary is that technological ties often, ubiquitously in fact, uh, give consumers features they want, uh, it says that judicial intervention into product design uh, risks chilling innovation. And that as a result, technol technological tying should be condemned only in exceptional cases where integration, which again, the definition of the technological tie is integration, serves absolutely no purpose other than to harm competitors. So it's actually to those of us who, who litigated the Microsoft, Microsoft case, it's, sounds fairly familiar uh, because it was the other side's position. So obviously we have a bit of an evolution uh, between from then and now in the government's position, uh, which among others, the Federal Trade Commission has been at pains uh, this week to point out. So just a very few quick comments because I, I think that on an issue like this, which, which admittedly does uh, involve very complicated questions, it's best to, to have the, the, the discussion guided by uh, questions and answers. 
Um, but going through very quickly the current DOJ's uh, view of, of tying, uh, I just want to make a few quick observations uh, as to how it contrasts with, which, by, with the way that we who tried the case on the government side uh, looked at the tying claims. First of all, I talked about how the DOJ seems to want to compartmentalize uh, the tying analysis, and it wants to do it in two ways. Number one, there's nothing in the DOJ's report which talks about looking at any particular element of conduct uh, in concert with other elements of a defendant's conduct. Whereas to us, who tried the case, it was crucial that each element of the case, each element of the al alleged anti-competitive conduct be viewed in concert with all the others. It would be fundamentally misleading, we thought, to consider the anti-competitive effects of any one element of conduct without considering the cumulative results of all of them. DOJ now also compartmentalizes the analysis by drawing these definitional distinctions between contractual ties, bundled ties, technological ties. And on this one, again, having thought in great deal as we led up to the trial, we very much wanted to resist the pigeonholing of the tying claims into one of, or, or, or another of, of, of those three. In fact, our view was, and we presented evidence at trial, that it was all three of them, and that you couldn't just look and shouldn't just look at the case as a question of technological integration because you had these contractual elements, terms in the licenses that Microsoft did with, with OEMs, um, and, of course, you had this issue of the non-removability of Internet Explorer from, from Windows, um, which, to us, very much distinguished the case from earlier cases in which you simply had a fact of integration without a coercive element. So that's the compartmentalization part. Uh, the second thing I mentioned is that um, the DOJ now uh, is suggesting that tying should be condemned only when the harms are substantially disproportionate, their words, uh, to pro-competitive benefits. And I think my only observation there, it wasn't, this one doesn't re relate so much to what we were thinking in, in, in doing the case, although I will note that whether a per se rule or the rule of reason applied to the tying claims, whether it's part of Section 2 or Section 1 in our case, was not of any great moment to us because we were very fully prepared, in part because of the D.C. Circuit's earlier opinion with regard to the earlier consent decree, for the fact that we very well may have to face a very high burden of proving anti-competitive effect, of proving an absence of pro-competitive purpose and intent. So again, we didn't tend to think, per se, rule of reason. And of course, the other one of the reasons why for, for that is that we were thinking primarily in terms of Section 2, where we knew there would have to be some form of, of balancing analysis, as opposed to Section 1. We didn't really distinguish the two. But the other key observation about the DOJ's substantially disproportionate test is that it does seem to go quite far beyond even the rule of reason, as it has been articulated elsewhere, including by the D.C. Circuit in this case, where the D.C. Circuit has talked about you simply have to show that the anti-competitive effects outweigh, not be substantially disproportionate, but outweigh the benefits. And then third, with respect to technological tying, um, the key point here I want to focus on is the definition. Uh, again, a tie, as DOJ says now, that is achieved through integration of what could be viewed as two products. And I think this one is key because I think the way you define a technological tie may or may not, may, probably will um, predetermine the outcome. If one is de intent on looking at a technological tie as simply integration, then it's very likely, because the Justice Department and others have observed that this is something that is very common, in fact ubiquitous, particularly in rapidly evolving markets, it's going to be very difficult to show that there aren't benefits or that, that the harm substantially outweigh the benefits or so forth. Our view was, my view remains today, that it's, it's a misnomer to simply say technological, technological tie equals integration. It's much more important to focus, in my view, and our view then, on the elements of coercion, the tie itself. Is there evidence that you have forcing, 
not only integration, which sometimes very much does pr provide benefits, <coughs> but do you have forcing? Do you have things like these contractual restrictions? Do you have non-removability? Do you have the fact that the benefits that this integration provides are equally available when you have the products de delivered separately as opposed to together? You know, certainly we didn't go into this case and we didn't try this case thinking that we by any means wanted to chill innovation. But this was precisely why we talked about things like what other operating system vendors did. On the one hand, you know, Microsoft put on some very good, very compelling evidence that what's the problem here? You know, all the operating system vendors in the world are doing the same kind of integration. It's very clear as the web becomes more and more important, more ubiquitous, we all want to integrate the browsing functionality into the operating system, or at least bundle it with the operating system. Whereas our point of view was, well, wait a second, let's really look. Firms without power, how are they doing it? Well, in every case, and Ed demonstrated this in, in his testimony, the other operating system vendors did bundle, uh, bundle browsers, but did so in an extraordinarily modular, removable way. In many cases, using browsers that they hadn't even developed themselves, at least not many, but in one or two cases, the browsers they hadn't even developed themselves. And so what this showed to us was there was a stunning lack of benefit. And then on the harm side, um, it was very important, just to finish up, um, that uh, the harm here you need to look at not only the tied product market, not only the browser market, but much more importantly, the tying product market as well. And other panels later today, I'm sure we'll talk about that in, in greater detail. The idea here that you have so much of the uh, tying activity in order to protect the monopoly that Microsoft had uh, in the operating system market. So I think I'll stop there. Um, hopefully that was, was coherent enough, but mostly um, wanted to sort of frame the issues, again, then versus now. And, and as <coughs> obvious, uh, you have um, a very, very different world view. Um, I, I think that uh, I was starting, starting to write some notes about the question of, well, would this case have been brought, brought today? But it didn't seem worthy of, of discussion. Um, because not, o not only do you have, you know, this analysis on tying, you also have a DOJ that has not brought any monopolization cases at all. So I'll leave it with that provocative comment. Okay, next we have Dave Heiner of Microsoft who will uh, give uh, some more perspectives on uh, the meaning of integration and uh, how uh, uh, the American and European antitrust agencies uh, are e evolving approaches to, to uh, uh, that phenomenon in the software industry. Well, thanks, Andrew. And um, I want to thank Phil for uh, inviting me and uh, my Microsoft colleagues uh, to this event and thank the Berkman Center. Uh, I have to say I do feel a little bit like an intruder at the reunion of the winning football team from, <laughs> from 10 years ago, but I'm glad you're here. It, it, it is good to be here. Uh, you know, during your walk down uh, memory lane yesterday as you went through Microsoft One and Microsoft Two and so forth, it reminded me of uh, when I first joined Microsoft, which was in uh, August of 1994. Uh, in the year preceding, that was the year that the DOJ had picked up the investigation from the FTC, and it was quite a big deal at the time. Um, and it settled in July of 1994. I got to work in August. Uh, and my job was to be the antitrust lawyer at Microsoft, the first sort of full-time dedicated antitrust person. I was looking forward to working on this matter. And I got to work and said, you know, congratulations, Bill Newcomb, on settling the case. Personally, I'm a little disappointed. I was looking forward to working on it. <laughs> and he said, there will be other matters. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, Turned out there was a little more than I ever had in mind. Um, excuse me. What, what, what I'd like to do now is um, just focus a little bit on uh, the remedy specifically uh, as it affects the design of Windows uh, and with respect to, in particular, the removability that, that Steve alluded to and, and uh, the coercion element and then compare how it came out in the U.S. and, and how it came out uh, in the European case. So I think there were really uh, kind of two categories of um, considerations here that were important. Uh, the first is really an end user perspective, and this is the 
promotion of the browser on new PCs. Uh, Professor Zittrain uh, talked about this yesterday and you know, quite accurately <coughs> explained the, the uh, concerns from the <coughs> DOJ side. The Microsoft browser was built into Windows and therefore uh, it would appear uh, on the desktop uh, in every copy uh, uh, of Windows and therefore on 90% of, of PCs. Um, Microsoft's point was yes, but there was no exclusion in the sense that there was no contract prohibiting OEMs from shipping the Netscape browser. And in fact, there was testimony that Sony, for instance, was shipping a machine uh, with four browsers on it. But the Justice Department and the states uh, explained that, well, in their view, uh, actually there was a disincentive for OEMs to ship that uh, additional browser because consumers might be confused uh, if they want to get to the internet and, and there's two icons there to get to the internet, which one would you click? And the court agreed with that testimony and that was uh, uh, a critical finding in the case, that this risk of consumer confusion if there were multiple browsers presented to the end user. The other aspect of the case that was much discussed was um, the platform aspects uh, of the browser. And this was important, of course, because the theory of the case was that Netscape might itself one day develop into a real platform that could support running applications. Now, Netscape never actually did the work to, to make that platform come to fruition. As Phil was saying, it was a nascent possibility. But there's some irony in that Microsoft did that work. And so in the 96, 97, 98 timeframe, it componentized the browser, meaning broke apart its functions, the ability to display HTML and the ability to handle the internet protocols, and made them available to the developer community. Um, and that, of course, is what Windows is. That it's a platform for running applications. And so Microsoft put a lot of emphasis at trial on, you know, isn't this a benefit? We're making the platform richer to enable it to, uh, you know, be relevant in the, in the internet age. And one of the points Microsoft emphasized, which was much discussed then uh, in court at all the different levels of the proceedings, was that developers want to know that if they write an application, it will run on every copy of Windows on every PC. And that way, uh, if an application is written, it will run on an HP machine and on a Dell machine because all the code will be there. And then users will know they can buy an HP machine or Dell machine and the applications will run. So this is the compatibility effect, which then gives rise to the network effect, which was much discussed. And so the question is sort of how do you address these considerations? There's the risk of confusion at the promotion level, and yet there seems to be, at least in Microsoft's view, this, this platform benefit. And the issue actually looms even larger than it sounds like from just discussing the browser case because the Justice Department in the States were saying, this is not just about the browser, this is potentially about other features as well. And there's quite a few features in a modern operating system. You know, I think it was Professor Arita probably in the 70s who observed uh, that any product can be conceived of as sort of the sum of its parts. You know, a car has a tire. Uh, and this uh, slide is just showing across the rows some features of operating systems as of a couple of years ago when I did the slide. And the columns are uh, four different operating systems, the Mac OS and uh, three versions of Linux. And you can see there's a lot of check boxes and there'd probably be more today if I updated it. Um, just showing there's quite a wide range of features. So when we're thinking about how should we handle the browser, we're potentially thinking about many, many, many features in the operating system. So what was the solution that was arrived at? Well, um, the, the, the solution worked out by the Justice Department and the states and then implemented uh, by Professor Felton was really to address the promotion advantage while trying to preserve, and in fact preserving, the platform benefits. And so Professor Felton built his uh, prototype removal program to demonstrate that it was entirely possible, which wasn't really disputed, but it was possible to remove the means of accessing the browser. And then at that point, as Professor Felton emphasized, it's as good as gone from an end user perspective. And an OEM could then ship a machine uh, if the tool had been run or if Microsoft had provided that ability, 
uh, and install Netscape, and it would appear as if Netscape were the only browser on the system. No user would think otherwise. At the same time, all of the underlying code, these are the DLLs that uh, Professor Chin was referring to, they're all still there. And so they're providing the benefits to the developers and they're providing benefits to other parts of Windows. So that seemed like uh, a sensible solution in the view of the court. It's the basis on which the district court ruled and on which the appellate court considered the subject. And it was then the basis of the remedy. So um, the remedy was that Microsoft had to create a tool that would enable the removability that uh, Steve Holtzman was referring to. That tool is in the system today, both in Windows XP and in Windows Vista, and OEMs are uh, authorized to use it as well. And so it enables the creation of a system at which, in which it appears that the browser is not present. Now that, um, that was then backed up by licensing terms as well. So OEMs have a set of rights, you know, on, uh, authorizing them to use those tools, to install any browser they want on the system, to promote that browser exclusively, and to set it as the default browser, which is just the browser that would come up if a user clicks a link uh, that's an internet link. So the remedy was really very well tuned to the liability finding. Risk of confusion and the risk of confusion uh, was eliminated by what was worked out by uh, the settlement process and then Judge Cotelli in the litigated remedies phase. So what can we say about this approach um, more generally? Now, I think what's interesting is that the focus of the consent decree with respect to this issue, the, the tying the design of Windows and, and in other respects, is all focused on increasing opportunities for competitors as opposed to constraining the design of Windows. So the idea was Netscape ought to be able to be installed by OEMs on PCs with no disincentive. Uh, it ought to install well. It ought to be able to be the default browser and the benefit here really is that consumers then get a choice of an integrated solution offered by Microsoft if they want, uh, and OEMs have that choice, or a standalone solution, Netscape, Mozilla, Firefox, whatever it may be. At the same time, the platform benefits are fully preserved. Um, one of the benefits from a legal perspective of nine states declining to join in the settlement and, and moving on for uh, the additional set of remedies that all these issues were explored sort of again uh, in the litigated remedies phase and then it went up on appeal again. And in that litigated remedies ruling by Judge Cotelli, she really emphasized that the, that the appellate court had emphasized the importance of the platform benefits. And she entered additional factual findings saying that uh, software developers and consumers would really be harmed if code were removed from Windows, if you had a solution where you were actually removing these blocks of code that constitute the platform uh, value of, of the browser. So that's the general approach, and in the consent decree, it's, it's backed up by a number of additional provisions relating to contracts, relating to interoperability, uh, relating to OEM relationships, and each and every one of those is focused on creating opportunities for other browser vendors not so much saying Microsoft should not design Windows in one way or another. And then uh, the other level of generalization is, as I was alluding to before, two additional features. And so it applies to email and instant messaging and media players and potentially other features um, as well. So what's happened with this uh, since 2001, which is when the decree uh, was voluntarily put into effect by Microsoft in, in 2002, it became uh, formalized. Microsoft has then taken the decree approach and generalized it further. And so, you know, as we think about new features in the operating system, even if they're not, strictly speaking, governed by the decree, we say, is there a way to build a feature into the operating system and at the same time ensure that competitors can offer something comparable that will work very well with the system and, and integrate in a nice way? Uh, and so an example here uh, might be, for instance, the way web search works uh, in Internet Explorer 7. Uh, and you know, it's a box that got created up there in the upper right-hand corner to really promote web search. And it's very easy to run a search against one search providers say Yahoo, 
and then with one click you can run it against Google and then you can run the same search against Live, Microsoft Live. You can run multiple searches quickly, you can change the default very easily, everyone sort of plugs in in a very convenient way. Uh, similarly, uh, we have a, a security center in Windows Vista that was a big push, uh, part of the Vista development, better security, and we really worked with Symantec and McAfee and with some regulatory agencies getting feedback through that loop on ways to design that system so that it would report, you know, is McAfee running, is it running correctly, is the Symantec firewall working properly, if not, go get a firewall, so that sort of thing. We then took that approach and um, presented that in a speech uh, Brad Smith gave a couple of years ago in DC uh, as a set of principles uh, that we would live by going forward that uh, generalize the decree approach uh, and extend it sort of in perpetuity that this is the way we will design Windows so that uh, computer manufacturers know, software developers know they can rely upon these principles as they go about uh, their business. And this is a commitment to the industry. These principles are up on our, our website for uh, all to see. The other uh, aspect I'd comment upon is um, features not included in Windows. You know, there was some concern during the trial that Windows could sort of become you know, the blob that takes over the earth as all interesting software in all categories would just be built in over time. And the, the extreme version of this was you know, often said, what would prevent Microsoft from, say, combining Office with Windows? Uh, and Phil and I used to discuss that from time to time. Um, and it hasn't happened, you know, obviously. Um, instant, and then some categories of software have actually you know, come out of Windows or not been added. And so, for instance, uh, instant messaging software was a concern during the decree. Uh, we ended up just removing that from Windows and offering it separately. Um, during the security push in connection with the design of Vista, a careful thought was given to should there just be antivirus software built in out of the box, you get your PC, you're safe, you're up and running. And we thought about that hard and decided for a mix of reasons you know, not to do that. And, and so um, you know, living under the rule of reason test of the DC circuit, that's something that we're giving thought to all the time and how we uh, design features into Windows or not into Windows. And there'll be some more news uh, about this um, in the coming weeks. Then in terms of the sort of industry reaction, I'd, I'd point to one or two things. Um, one thing we see today for sure is a very wide range of software shipped on PCs uh, in many, many categories. And you know, this was one of the overall objectives of the case, to ensure that OEMs would feel free to install any software they want, browsers or, or anything else. And you know, today, there's so much software shipped on new PCs that it's actually created a new market opportunity for retailers to charge people a fee to take it off of the PCs, mm -hmm. which is kind of an astonishing thing. <laughs> you know, Microsoft gets a, a royalty of something like $60, $70 uh, for a copy of Windows, and retailers are getting $30 just to go out and, and sort of clean up software off, off these machines for users who, who want that, uh, which is an interesting, I think, sort of contrast. Um, the other thing I'd point to is the growing um, use of web-based uh, applications. Uh, and this is quite interesting, I think, in, in two respects. I'm talking about things like Facebook now and SmugMug and you know, Picasa, uh, all uh, out on the internet. But one is there's no possibility of uh, integrating these things with Windows because they're not client code. You know, they're, they're out there on the browser, so in, uh, out there on the uh, internet. So they're inherently separate, and, and that risk of sort of Windows incorporating them doesn't exist. The other, which is, I think, quite interesting, is um, these applications are, of course, accessible via any browser running on any operating system, uh, which will tend to diminish the famous applications barrier to entry over time. And of course, it was actually, that was the, the nascent threat posed by Netscape, was that it would develop some platform. And that was supposed to be kind of a client code platform, as I understood it. You know, with Java and other technologies that would enable um, applications to run on multiple operating systems. Well, we, we're seeing that coming to fruition today in a somewhat different way, which is based on, on internet standards. And then there's kind of an irony here, which is that by Microsoft 
enhancing Windows with support for these internet standards, it really promotes the development of those applications. So I want to just close, I know I'm, I'm running a little here, uh, short on time, but I just wanted to close then briefly with what happened over in Europe, uh, because that, that case has been quite interesting. Um, there's two aspects to the case. I'll just focus on the, the tying aspect of the case. Uh, and there, the European Commission uh, was focused not so much on the browser in this uh, case, but on Windows Media Player. And so this is software that plays back audio and video. And many of the arguments were, uh, on both sides, uh, somewhat familiar uh, from the US case. Uh, there was the promotion advantage that the Commission emphasized. If the media player was on every PC, people would tend to use the Microsoft media player. And then there was the platform side. And here Microsoft said, you know, in the 21st century, you want to have audio and video in a modern operating system, and applications developers want to be able to provide audio and video, and so it makes a lot of sense to build that in. And we pointed to the findings of Judge Cotelli saying, in fact, it would be positively harmful to the industry and to consumers to remove that platform code. And the Commission's uh, response was essentially, you know, funny you would bring that up. Uh, because the very thing that you're saying is pro-competitive, we regard as anti-competitive. And, and the reason is that if Microsoft is free to build in this platform code to Windows, it will generate a network effect uh, of applications using that code, that's why Microsoft built it in after all, uh, which will then cause more people to use the client code and it will feed on itself and over time, the Microsoft media player will be the only media player you know, with any market share. Now this allegation was being made right around the time or right before the emergence of iTunes as the leading platform for running, application, for running uh, playing back music on the client side and Adobe Flash as the leading platform for audio and video on the internet. But anyway, that was the allegation. That's what the court, the commission found. And the, as for remedy, what the commission said was, it's okay that Microsoft built the media player into Windows. What's not okay was failing to provide a choice of a version of Windows without Media Player. And so in the Commission's view, the logical remedy for tying, where they conceived of the product as including the platform code, was untying. And you know, that is logical. Uh, and so the Commission ordered Microsoft to create a version of, of Windows XP and then Windows Vista that excluded Windows Media Player. And Microsoft did that. Uh, sales of that have been negligible uh, to date. Uh, and so, you know, we have a situation where liability was uh, found for failing to, failing to produce a product for which it turns out there's no demand. But, but that was the theory of the case, and that was affirmed, you know, by the court in September 2007, the court not really taking account under their jurisprudence of the sales, because it sort of came after the commission decision, and they were just looking at the commission decision. Now, just to wrap up then, um, a comparison of, of the two cases. Uh, in the US side, uh, of course, it's a rule of reason test as the uh, Court of Appeals ruled, uh, in large part focusing on the platform benefits that Judge uh, Jackson hadn't really given much weight to. On the European side, it's more akin to a per se approach. This is somewhat controversial to say. The commission itself might disagree. They would say they looked at the range of factors the court ultimately said that in looking at the foreclosure side, was there foreclosure of other media players, that was kind of extra credit for the commission. They didn't really need to do that. And the real focus was just, is there separate demand for media players? And if so, it's a tie. And that really looks like a per se test to me. Uh, in the US, as I was saying, the addition of the platform benefits, as the Court of Appeals looked at it and Judge Cotelli, seems to be a pro-competitive uh, 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 conduct in the European Union. That's anti-competitive, it seems. And finally, as a matter of remedy, you know, on the US side, it's really focused on promoting opportunities for competitors, not so much limiting the design of Windows. And on the European Union side, it's more focused on taking code out of Windows, which is a concern to us as you then apply it to more than one feature. So. Thank you, Dave. Finally, we have uh, Ed Felton, who will uh, speak to uh, the government's theory of the case uh, 10 years later. And I'll get his slides up. Thanks. That, that's what you should see. Um, <laughs> 11 years ago, if uh, someone had suggested to me that I would willingly set foot in a law school on a Saturday morning, 
I would not have believed them. Uh, and if they had suggested that I was going to be speaking in that law school on a Saturday morning, I certainly wouldn't have believed that. But all of that started to change in October 1997. Uh, one day, I was sitting in a crummy hotel room in Sunnyvale, California, and I dialed up to the internet and picked up my email, and I got this. Uh, this uh, is from a, an attorney at the Department of Justice. We're seeking a technical consultant for an investigation we're currently undertaking in the software industry. I thought, that must be Microsoft. Um, I'd appreciate it if you'd call me to discuss this matter, et cetera, et cetera. I thought about it for a while, and I called her, and um, one thing led to another, and here I am in a law school on a Saturday morning. But um, uh, I don't want to spend my time on nostalgia. I'd prefer to spend it on hindsight. So <laughs> let me look. What I want to do here is talk about the government's theory of the case, the basic argument that the government made about the, uh, about the technology and the market, and to look back on that with the benefit of knowing what's happened in the last 10 years in that market. OK, so very quickly, let me review the government's theory. Uh, first of all, the government argued that Microsoft had monopoly power in the market for PC operating systems. Second, that Netscape and Java threatened to reduce, the, uh, uh, threatened to reduce that monopoly power. And third, that Microsoft acted anti-competitively to protect that monopoly power. Today, I'm going to leave aside number three, the question of the, uh, uh, um, of the challenged acts of Microsoft. And just to talk about the structure of the market, what was going to happen, what the government said was going to happen had Microsoft not acted, um, and again, compare it to what we have seen happen. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit more. If you look under Microsoft having monopoly power, there are basically two aspects to that. Um, if, again, we're leaving aside uh, evidence from what Microsoft did. Uh, the first one is high market share, and of course high market share with the application barrier to entry, making it hard for, um, uh, for new operating system products to come into the market. The application's barrier to entry, again, to review pretty quickly. Uh, here we have Windows and an application that runs on top of Windows. By runs on top of Windows, what we really mean at the technical level is that this application A has to talk to Windows to ask it to do things so the application can run. And Windows, like every operating system, has its own um, quirky and, and difficult language that you have to speak in order to get it to do things. And the application developer would have to devote a fair amount of work to making their application speak the language that Windows understood. And this was the case for all the other applications as well. Every application had to invest a significant amount of development time in getting their application to work with Windows, just as they would with any other operating system. Okay, so along comes a new operating system, uh, which is going to enter the market. Uh, and the developer of application A, if they want to get their application to run on Windows, I'm sorry, on the new operating system, if they want to port it across, um, is going to have to get their um, application to speak the language of this new operating system. So let's make an analogy, say that Windows speaks English and the new operating system speaks Spanish. So we'll dub it Nuevo OS. Uh, Nuevo OS speaks Spanish. And if you want your application to run on Nuevo OS, you have to teach it to speak Spanish. Or at least you need to give it enough phrases that it can ask the operating system to do what it needs to do. And that's a bunch of work for the application developer. It's costly. Um, if you want other applications to do the same, you have to teach each of them to speak Spanish, and you can't just get them all in a classroom and teach them. You, you have to do the work individually for each application. You need lots of applications to make the uh, Nuevo OS actually viable in the market. This is expensive, um, and that poses a significant barrier to entry. That's essentially the government's theory about a barrier to entry. Now, when a browser comes along, uh, Netscape and Java, um, what they do is change this story a little bit. Uh, so what they do in particular is they kind of jack up these applications and they slide underneath it a new thing uh, which uh, the government dubbed in, in, in their theory of the case middleware. Uh, so you can imagine that this brown thing is a browser and the browser speaks English to talk to Windows um, and it exposes a different kind of interface up at the top. The applications can speak, let's say, Esperanto to the, to the browser. The browser will translate that into English and talk to Windows. Um, all right, now if Nuevo OS comes along, um, if you want to port all of this stuff to run on top of Nuevo OS, you need to take the browser and teach it to speak Spanish. But once you've done that, you can just drop the applications right in place because they speak Esperanto to the browser just like before. And so in order to make everything work on Nuevo OS here, 
you need to teach just one program, the browser, to speak Spanish. That's a lot uh, cheaper, it's a lot more reasonable and easier, and you can imagine that a new operating system entrant might be able to um, afford it. Therefore, the arrival of this middleware, the government argued, would uh, reduce the barrier to entry, and that's what Microsoft uh, was afraid of. Now, this is the story the government told at, um, at the trial, and it was a story that was uh, adopted by, by the courts, um, essentially. And um, so I want to look at this story and, uh, and actually evaluate it against what we know. Well, there's a key technical contention that underlies all of this, and that is the contention that serious applications could be run in browsers, um, um, which, um, uh, which we've learned something about in, in the years since. Uh, is it the case that serious applications could be written to run on top of browsers this way? Or to put it another way, is it the case that an application can, uh, can live a healthy, prosperous life while talking to the world through an Esperanto interpreter? Well, let's look at what happened. Um, and I'm going to divide the years since 1998 into two periods. Uh, the first period, uh, 1998 through 2003, and the second one, uh, the first five years and the second five years. In the first five years, um, here's, what, um, here's, my, here's my capsule version of the history of those years in the browser market. First, Netscape withered away and Internet Explorer came to seriously dominate the browser market. Um, second, I think the pace of browser innovation slowed during this period. Um, browsers continued to advance, new versions came out, but we didn't see the rate of progress that we had seen during the height of the browser war uh, in the late 90s. Uh, um, and there was talk at the time about whether the browser was now a mature product that wasn't going to advance anymore or not advance at the same rate um, or, or, or what. But um, I think it's pretty clear that the pace of innovation did slow down. And significantly, during this period, serious applications really did not run in browsers. You had a few toy applications, maybe a few um, things that were suggestive that they might someday, um, but we did not see the, uh, um, we did not see uh, Esperanto speaking applications in any significant numbers during this five year period. Right, now the second five year period, 2003 to 2008. Uh, we saw Firefox rise from the ashes of Netscape. Firefox uh, started to become somewhat more popular. It reached double digits in market share. Um, and was seen as a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a real competitor to Internet Explorer, having, um, having uh, feature parity or, or uh, in some people's views, maybe a slight advantage, um, at, at least at some points. The pace of innovation did seem to quicken. We, uh, we saw new features coming in. We saw, um, uh, we saw um, investment of, uh, by open source developers and companies in Firefox. We saw Microsoft um, pushing more resources uh, into browser development. Um, and we've seen, um, even in the last year, I think a, an increase in the pace of investment and uh, in innovation in the browser market again. We're now starting to see some serious applications run in browsers. Um, uh, many people I know, including me at times, um, spend a lot of more time inside the web browser and we're seeing a lot more of the things that people do being delivered as web-based applications, um, more or less uh, as predicted. And of course, as Dave mentioned, we're also seeing the rise of a new class of applications which really make sense only in browsers. Um, running Facebook on your own computer not connected to the internet, not that interesting. Um, but, uh, but we're seeing uh, the rise of these social applications which, um, uh, which really make more sense to run in a kind of browser setting. So not only applications that um, are taught to teach Esperanto, but um, applications that sort of were born speaking Esperanto. Okay. So there's an obvious contrast here in the first period, the first five years, no serious applications in the browser. In the second five years, we do see serious applications in browsers. So what changed? Something apparently changed around 2003, um, which caused uh, serious applications in browsers to become a reality. Uh, and I want to put forth two possible explanations for what it is that changed uh, around 2003. Two theories of, of, of what it was. The first one is the competition theory. The competition theory says that the key enabler for the arrival of these web-based applications was browser competition. Uh, as browsers competed, as they got faster, as they, uh, as they took on more features, um, it became more uh, viable to, uh, uh, to, to make these applications and developers uh, seeing a more competitive browser market um, uh, may have had more trust that 
browsers, uh, the browser standards would be more stable, uh, thus protecting their investment in, um, uh, in developing these apps. So if you, believe, if you accept this theory, then um, in the first period, 1998 to 2003, there was less competition and innovation, but later on, we saw the rise of Firefox driving competition, and this is, according to this theory, is what um, led to the rise of web-based applications. The other theory is the technology theory that says that the key enabler, the thing that happened around 2003, was a set of changes in technology that, in fact, um, that in fact web-based applications were never really realistic in 1998 uh, and it was only things that happened around 2003 that made them realistic. So what were those things that, that, that might have happened? Um, I think there are three plausible candidates. Uh, the first one is faster computers. Moore's Law made computers faster. Um, running an application inside a browser does carry a, a performance penalty and arguably you needed a faster computer in order to make all of this work. Um, so maybe faster computers um, uh, made it possible. Another possibility is, the pen, is broadband penetration. Um, uh, arguably, you may have needed a faster network to make these applications work. These applications are always chattering to some backend, um, to some backend server that holds your data. And unless that can happen quickly, um, uh, arguably, you can't make these applications um, work well. And so it may have been that you needed to have a certain number of homes and offices with broadband internet in order to make web-based applications a viable business model. Uh, the third uh, candidate here has to do with programming tools and know-how. The argument here is that in 1998, we just didn't know how to write these applications. We didn't have the tools, we didn't have the know-how, and it was only the birth of, um, it was only the, the maturation of technologies like JavaScript, and it was only the, the growth of programming um, methodologies like the so-called AJAX methods that, um, um, that really made it viable to write these applications. And uh, in other words, that we needed to spend, that the programming community needed to spend five years noodling around before they figured out how to actually make a good application. Um, all right, so uh, why does it matter which, which uh, these theories is right? Well, if the competition theory is right, then the reduced competition um, that we saw in this first five year period actually has held back progress and we are not as far advanced in the technology as we would have been had there been more vigorous competition during that period. On the other hand, if the technology theory is right, then maybe the impact of competition um, in, um, in the period right after the, the case uh, was brought um, mattered less. Uh, maybe it really was a case of needing to wait for the technology to, to wake up or needing to wait for technologists to noodle around. That's not to say that the, case, that the, um, um, that, that the, uh, the lawsuit mattered not at all in the structure of the market or the behavior of, of companies, but, um, but, it, but if this technology theory is right, then it at least had less impact on the, uh, the web that we see today. This is why you have to prepare witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So which theory is right? I don't know. Um, this, as, um, as I prepared for this talk and I talked with this, about this stuff with my colleagues and students, we had quite a few interesting lunchtime debates about which theory was right. So I'm not going to tell you which one I think is right. Instead, I want to just keep telling you history uh, and give you an optimistic history for the next five years. Um, and I'm feeling like an optimist this morning, so this will be the optimistic version. All right. Um, but plausible. Uh, the first part of the optimistic history, that competition continues to heat up in the browser world between Internet Explorer, Firefox, and now Google's Chrome browser, which I think is, um, uh, is a pretty interesting competitor in this space, increased browser competition. Second, that Microsoft, as a result, is, uh, pours even more resources into browser and web technologies. Um, that, um, and so we see um, significant advancements in, in Internet Explorer, uh, as well as in the other browsers. Uh, third, that because of this uh, investment uh, on all sides, we see some fundamental advances in browser engineering, and we see some changes in the way that browsers work, um, which, lead to, um, which lead to a different kind of web than we see today. But of course, um, uh, but of course um, the, que the question that follows is which of the competitors comes up with, um, with, that, uh, with those advances and how easily can they be adopted by the other competitors? Um, because this is the future, I'm not going to even try to predict. 
Uh, and assuming this optimistic future where we see more competition and increased investment and fundamental advances, um, consumers win. Um, so the short version of this future history is that Microsoft gets a do-over on the browser war and, uh, and really does it right this time. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Ed. Um, uh, in, in setting up my, uh, my uh, at least initial question to the panel, uh, I, uh, I, I want to return to this question of uh, defining a, a software product, and uh, in, in particular, uh, uh, I, without taking a position on whether uh, tying analysis should uh, should move from a nominal per se approach to, uh, to to the rule of reason approach suggested by the DC Circuit and, and the Justice Department. Um, just to su suggest that uh, Microsoft shouldn't be the thin en end of the wedge in in making that change, um, and in, in in fact uh, su suggesting that uh, uh, a more explicit recognition of the legal significance of uh, of Ed Felton's uh, 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 technical contributions to the case uh, would have uh, really put the, um, uh, the analysis on point with Jefferson Parish and addresses uh, the idea that uh, there are pro-competitive benefits to expanding the platform uh, that, uh, th those, to the extent that there are benefits, uh, those, are not, th those do not come out of benefits of the tying conduct. Uh, so uh, Microsoft's position, again, in proposed findings of fact were that uh, the software product uh, consists of uh, code and nothing else. Uh, but uh, with respect to, to our Microsoft colleagues, I, I uh, strongly suspect that Microsoft wouldn't take the same litigation position in the copyright infringement suit, i.e. that someone who purchased a, a Microsoft software product thereby had purchased the code. Um, uh, instead, I, I suggest in, in the articles uh, that I have at registration, and if we're out of them, it's at, it's at my site, andrewchin.com, uh, a software product can be t defined explicitly as inspired by um, uh, Ed's uh, implicit definition at, at trial uh, as a set of legal rights as specified in the license accompanying the, the, uh, the copy of the software and technological capabilities that enable the use of the accompanying software as specified uh, in accompanying documentation related to the accompanying software, but it doesn't include the software itself. Okay, and just to nail down this intuition, when you buy a, a Region 2 DVD, you're not buying the movie, you're buying the legal right uh, to uh, watch the movie on a uh, DVD player in the appropriate region, and uh, that's backed up by uh, digital rights management, so you're limited technologically uh, to uh, use of, of those players. It does again, and it again does not include the movie itself. And so using the implicit formulation uh, that, that Ed used at trial, you define the product, the DVD product, as that which allows the user to watch the movie on a player in Europe. Um, so uh, uh, Ed's d uh, demonstration, uh, his, his prototype removal program, had the effect of, of demonstrating uh, that Windows is an OS product plus a browser product, uh, which can be uh, de described implicitly as that which allows the user to install and run Windows apps plus that which allows the user to browse the web. And then, by inference, the browser product um, uh, consists of uh, the browsing rights uh, that uh, uh, Microsoft might draft into a separate add-on uh, license. Uh, plus a, uh, technological capabilities that would be delivered through an inverse prototype re removal program uh, that re replaced the uh, so-called Feltonized Windows 98 with, with the uh, one uh, uh, marked by Mi uh, Microsoft, uh, thereby creating that which allows the user to browse the web. Uh, so the tie, in essence, is then a, a contractual tie, uh, not a classic t uh, technological tie. Um, it's, a, it's a mass market license, reasonably understood to bundle the OS product with the, the browser product, backed up by, by DRM defaults. 
And so the claim of, of new APIs delivered by the platform are, are really not an additional benefit that's delivered by the tie. Uh, and in fact, Microsoft 3 is entirely on point with Jefferson Parish uh, if, if we, we have this intuition in mind. Uh, Jefferson Parish, you're not buying the operating theater. Uh, you're buying surgical and, and anesthesiological services, which uh, uh, arguably uh, are, are separately demanded. And uh, it's the same operating theater that facilitates the provision of those services in the same way that the same body of code, the same DLLs, uh, facilitate provision of the OS and the browser functionalities. But uh, the, the uh, patient is, is buying the services, not the operating theater, and the user is buying the functionalities, not the code. Okay, so with, with that, uh, I, I'd like, to, uh, first, I, I guess I'd like to give Dave an opportunity to respond to, to that, but uh, then uh, in the interest of time, I guess we should open up to the general questions. Yeah, I guess I would just say that, um, you know, in Microsoft's view, if that's the way uh, regulatory agencies want to look at the issue, which essentially is how it was looked at, I think, in, in the Department of Justice case against Microsoft, you know, that's fine. Um, and that's the remedy that's in place, and that's what we're living with. It's very much the focus on the end user. Is the user able to browse the web, yes or no? Microsoft ought to let users remove that, and Microsoft does that today, and we're extending that approach to multiple other features. Um, you know, looking back on it, the whole debate about, you know, what is the browser, what is the code, we spent a lot of time on that at the trial, uh, and a fair bit of time on that with the European Commission, and there's sort of no answer to the question. I mean, Professor Chin was proposing an approach just now. I'm suggesting it's fine. Um, other people might have other thoughts about that. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is that people come to work, they build this operating system called Windows. It consists of code, and so it seems like that's part of the product. The code interacts with other code uh, in ways as various dependencies. The code's functions are exposed to developers. They can call into it. And you, know, you can take a sort of carving knife and say, well, this is the media player or that's the media player. And there's no real answer to it. I mean, it, as Phil said to me at dinner last night, it's almost like an existential question. You know, what's, what's the browser? What's the media player? And the only real question is, what's the best design from the perspective of enabling removability or what should get built in in the first place from a, from a competitive perspective? And you know, we have the answer in the US, which is focus on the end user. And, and risk of confusion, and the answer in Europe seems to be different. Uh, yes, Dave Heimer has <coughs> told, <coughs> excuse me, told us that he doesn't think you can integrate um, Web 2.0 applications with the operating system, and Ed Felton today, at least, is very optimistic about consumers winning from these new kinds of applications, but what if you're web surfing on your iPhone, and could you both comment on tethering? in this context, because you're not really surfing the web, you're surfing the portal that your device operating system owner lets you surf. Well, the iPhone is actually an interesting example here, as, as you point out. Um, if you want to use Facebook on the iPhone, for example, there are two different ways you can do it. You can open up your web browser and go to facebook.com, and then you get essentially the experience you'd get from any browser, only in a smaller window. Uh, or you can uh, open up the Facebook app that, um, that uh, ships for the iPhone, and that indeed has to be approved by Apple um, and, um, uh, and will only do what Apple allows it to do. Um, and uh, I think it's an interesting question whether there's an inherent advantage to the built-in app. Um, I, in fact, find I do use it. Um, but if, um, if Apple... Uh, insists on too many limitations on its use, people can always shift over to the web uh, case. It's, uh, it's rather like this. Um, uh, this is, I think, related to, to the question I raised um, uh, earlier about, um, about how much an application has to give up in order to run through a browser as opposed to running directly on the, on, on the client system. Um, and uh, I, I do think there is something, especially on a small device like that, which technologically is back maybe where um, PCs were in 2003. Marco. Okay. Sorry, Marco. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm at the Harvard Business School and I teach on the economics and management of uh, innovation, particularly in the software industry. So I've been looking at this issue for about 20 years. Uh, this, I think, is a really important topic 
because uh, one of the things I focus on is the fact that, for the most part, uh, innovation in this industry is integration. The fundamental new discovery of new concepts at the fundamental level is rare. If you look at more of the uh, research that years ago with, with their thesis, the fact that when we innovate new products, we're very making old concepts. Uh, and we are expanding our horizons by recombining old ideas and new ideas. And that's how innovation happens. So the time issue, right, is really important. Uh, I have been to a lot of conferences at Harvard Business School where the, the people that participate are not so much companies that are investigated, but more companies that no longer exist. And so we have you know, the old wangs and digitals that come along, and here are organizations that are not innovated enough, and not innovated to be integrated in time, and not expanding as a result of the longer around. So, Marco, I have around this for a second. You got your mic there, so oh, I'm sorry. Push the little red button. This one? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so anyway, so it's a balance while on the one hand, of course, uh, you need to do the right things. At the same time, you do want to respond to what's going on in the environment around you, and that's what we teach our students. And maybe we should stop teaching that, but hopefully not. Um, uh, a couple of things that are important about this space. I also I wanted to address uh, a little bit of also what's happened in the industry in the last few years, uh, because we've looked at that a lot. I've studied it and researched it. And uh, a lot of things have happened. Uh, it's interesting that on the one hand, we talk about uh, Microsoft um, sort of not being able to uh, do certain things, and then we complain about Microsoft not being innovative. We also have to understand it's an organization that uh, if you imagine yourself running the browser project in Microsoft in uh, 2002, 2003, you're probably under a certain amount of pressure to do things in a certain way. It's not such an easy thing to actually get right. Uh, but the reality is that the investment in the technologies was quite large and uh, expanded a lot over the years, and uh, at least from an internal perspective, the innovation was probably fairly significant. Um, the, uh, the major development, I think, that, that, that Professor Felton talked about is a really important one, which is that with sort of Web 2.0 technologies, we have a whole new generation of, of plugins uh, in, to the browser. They're really where the action is right now in terms of writing these applications. So we have... Uh, Things like, uh, well, Java now, but, but also Flash Player and things like that that have a penetration in the market, which is in the high 90s, uh, and they're basically installed on every PC. So we can run applications uh, like that across the board. And it's been around for a while. Even in 2001, 2002, the major enterprise applications were certainly browser-based. Uh, so that's, that's uh, been there for a, for a few years. So it, I think it's an interesting environment because if we actually look at the concept of the application of barrier to entry, I don't think we, what we see today is what we might have seen 10 years ago. Uh, it's a very different environment. Most applications are uh, operating system uh, agnostic. Users spend 55% of their time, I think, on average on the internet uh, instead of uh, on the computer itself. Um, and most of the stuff that we have even on the client is now available on multiple platforms. So if you actually look at what people have the run. I think there's been huge changes in the last 10 years, and it's one of the things that's useful to actually take a look at. So it's good that we look at the history. I don't think it's so much so much for me. I don't know if Ed, you you have um, thoughts about. It. I mean, I think that the, the one thing I would say about it is to go back to Ed's comments about the question of the tech. You know, what's changed or what changed in this 2003 time frame? Is technology or the competition? You know, now of course, you know. If, we, if Ed were the witness, as I was joking about before, you know, probably would have urged, well, Ed, is it really an either or question? No, it's, it's absolutely not an either or question, and that would help refine that testimony and, and, and make it more, <laughs> more truthful. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, we should have spent more time on this, I guess. <laughs> not that we worked very much before you testified, actually. Yeah. It was all totally unrehearsed and, you know, just, you know, unprepared. But, um, no, I, I mean, I think the harder question really is, in the broader sense, you know, the competitive landscape, and particularly the competitive landscape in the context of this case and what it, what it tried to achieve. How much of a difference did it make, and how much of the landscape did it open up? And I, I confess I have not actually spent a lot of time thinking about that very much, and, and maybe, maybe I should have. But I think, in part, it's because it's a very, very difficult question to answer. Um, I, you have all these different factors that you have to control for, and you can't control for them. Um, with respect to how software developers are, th are thinking about Microsoft and how they're thinking about the industry and when what they can do, um, but you know I think that it would be wrong given the, the many the many lessons we've had about the importance of a competition in many industries to, to to simply write off the the idea 
that uh, competition competition really matters. Andrew, maybe one last question, and then we should probably break, just so we don't get too far off time. Uh, I, I had a question for Steve, and the question is, uh, what do you think of the DOJ's decision not to pursue the Section 1 tying claim on remand? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, um, you know, it was a case that, that uh, based on the, the evidence that, that we had all, all put in, um, both expert testimony and, and fact, fact evidence and documents, that it's a case that was very, very, very winnable under the standards that the D.C. Circuit are articulated. In fact, I think pretty much all the evidence was already there to win it, which is, you know, one reason why, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't mind the, you know, I was gone for the government to that point, but didn't mind the D.C. Circuit opinion, um, didn't think it was clearly wrong. Um, you know, but, um, you know, all the elements were in place. And so I think sort of regretted that, that the D.C. Circuit couldn't see. Maybe, maybe it was in the way the, the, the case was presented at the Court of Appeals. I mean, I don't know about the guy who was arguing the case, but, um, um, you know, we had gone to great lengths to try to satisfy all those burdens, as I said before, you know, under the rule of reason, as well as under a per se analysis. I mean, I want to revisit, by the way, and just a very, very quick last comment. I said before that we didn't care very much whether it was rule of reason or per se. That's actually not entirely right. I mean, we put the Section 1 case in, in, in part because we said, hey, we got this per se rule, let's use it. Um, but in proving the case is what I meant. Um, it, it wasn't something that, that held us back by any means. David would like. Yeah, let, let me just, I, I don't usually comment, you know, take the role of the Justice Department, but, but for this group, let me just, let, let me just, it, it would be fun for me to kind of role play. Let, let me just remind the group what the Justice Department said at the time, which was that they could get all the relief they wanted under the Section 2 theory where liability was affirmed without having to retry the Section 1. And, and the point there was that the theory under Section 2 and Section 1 was what Professor Chin was just talking about and Professor Felton, which was this focus on the end user. And, and they wanted relief which would say, Microsoft ought to enable you know, computer manufacturers to ship machines without the browser and appearing to the end user and, and, and users ought to be able to do that. And that was in fact put in place. The other thing where I just, would maybe disagree with Steve a little bit in terms of were all the elements lined up to win on a tying claim on remand, even if there were a reason to try it. The appellate court had said that the uh, uh, district court had failed to enter proper factual findings to establish that there even was a separate market yep. for browsers right. and that the agency could not put in new evidence on that point. And you know, under, under a rule of reason test, then it seemed like it was going to be pretty hard. To, to establish harm in a market that hadn't been established. Except, you know, and I come back, I, I feel I know you want to wrap up, but, but you know, even under the DOJ's new policy statement, there is a recognition that, you know, tying can have significant anti-competitive effects back into the tying product market. And although, I, you know, the DC Circuit, I'm not sure, was ready to acknowledge that. I think that is one thing that was a little flawed from my perspective in the DC Circuit opinion. But I think that had that case been retried, obviously trying to pass through this browser space, even if you didn't define it as a market, and get back to a very clear anti-competitive harm in the tying product market is something that was a very solid theory, and in fact one that animated this case as distinguished, for example, potentially from the kinds of cases that the EU has brought. And then the interesting question would have been, what different remedy would you have? But I, uh, absolutely. Have to right. now. Absolutely. <laughs> That's absolutely the fascinating question. Uh, Andrew, our panel, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking them. <laughs> Let's